from one little subject. We, we wrote your name. Great job. And here's a cook. Like I'm just brainstorming in my head right now. So maybe you're thinking about modifying your schedule of reinforcement, how often you reinforce. Instead of the obsessive, And another thing I would expand her repertoire of what she will work for because you're going to satiate on cookies and you're not going to have anything that will work. Um, yeah, they're animal crackers, but she doesn't know. They're animal crackers? Yeah. But so, she doesn't know they're not yeah. cookies. They're and you do cookies. know, for satiation purposes, that you bust off and give her the head first, or you give her, you know, a leg. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Right. And then you eat, use each of those as a communicative request. You hold it up. What is this? Leg. Make her sign leg, give you leg, whatever. <laughs> Say leg. And then she gets the leg, even though it's part of it. <laughs> Okay, any, anybody else? No, ABI strategies? Okay, licking, we've talked about so far, will they be helpful on the current students you're working with? Yeah? Yes, ma'am. I just have a question. Um, you have some ideas of how you stop this email from being touched by the Nose picking? You got a nose picker. Okay. Well, how high functioning are they? Um, they're pretty high. Does anything gross them out? Ever? Not that I know. Like a kid eating with their mouth open or... No? Dog poop? I should. Okay. Because what I'm saying is if he's high functioning enough, you can compare it can for him it. to something is absolutely disgusting for him. So that's one thing. Another thing is, does he have, is it, is he, uh, does he have allergies? Is it running off constantly? I think that it has just become habitual, and I'm thinking that it's, um, with two different heads, that it's like sunscreen. Yeah, right. I know, it makes your nose. Yeah, you know, you're not going to go to high school. Yeah bad thing was they were probably well on their way, but if they gave them something to play with, there's something, the sensory input you're getting is not tactile to play with. It's actually right here. You know what I mean? You're poking something up in your nose. And so they should have probably focused more on this or more on this external stimulation as opposed to giving the child something to play with. Um, but I would compare it to really something that they find disgusting. So every kid finds something disgusting. Yes. Because it's habitual. Nobody wants to sit by them. You know, and I mean, in some ways, the kids are higher than we have that discussion, but it has a Right. Right. I and mean, it could be something as much as having a Kleenex on the side of the desk and tapping. It could be um, having a Kleenex box on the side of the desk and tapping it to where you're not drawing vast amount of attention to it for the other students, but you are drawing it toward him. Um, and then you're going to reinforce for lower occurrences. If you see it going down, even though it's still happening, we'd like to take that to zero, right? Because that's a disgusting behavior. Even though I can pull up at a stop sign and see somebody with their finger up their nose to their knuckle, right? I, I always think, do you think you have blackout windows? Because you don't, right? Um, we want that at zero, but we're going to be OK with if they only engage it in five times if it was previously 20. Right, in and, an and you'll base that um, in terms of the evidence-based practice of DRL, so differential reinforcement of lower rates of behavior, is what that strategy is called. And you'll base that on the average of your baseline data. So if you take data on it and you see that it's occurring on average every three minutes then you want to reinforce them for the average of every four and then every five and then every ten and then every fifteen until you can decrease your rate which sounds ridiculous but think it does about sound the ridiculous social but impact of picking your nose has when you're an older you're not going to get a job People are going to be grossed out at church. They're going to be grossed out in restaurants. They're, you're, it's going to be like raid, right? Kills everything around you. So yeah, that's what you have to think about the future, what that behavior holds for him. Um, yeah. 
I would start with one, um, and if, if you think about like the FBA, for that's gaining sensory probably for him or her, um, and then you would pick one class period to collect that data in. Don't tell yourself you have to take data for seven hours on that, because if it's happening in every environment, pick one, look at how often that's happening, and then set your reinforcement schedule based on the average across that. Does that make sense? And for something like that, you know, I never carry a pen and pencil and do stuff like that. Yeah. I always use rubber bands or something that I can manipulate. I, I never have pockets, so I don't use pennies and stuff like that. Um, but I use the mailer rubber bands, you know, the big ones that you can put on your wrist. And then I just move one to the other wrist every time I see it happen. It's super easy. No one even knows it's happening. Mm -hmm. I can collect data on my students and my university classes and then I'll report it at the end. I'll write it up on the board and they're freaked out by it because they didn't know I was counting. So it's that easy. And okay. then you just look at that over that hour. So you say, yeah. I've been in here an hour and now I've got 15 rubber bands on this hand and versus for, this. For hand. you headbangers, this is a very similar behavior because it's still mm -hmm. going to impede in his ability to be included and to participate because it's a gross behavior. And the other thing I would find out is ask his mom, what's he really grossed out by? Is it, like mm -hmm. I said, dog poop? I said dog poop and you're like, dog poop? Okay. So if it's something like that, then you sit down and you say, picking your nose equals dog poop. Every, it's that gross to everyone else in here. Okay. That's <laughs> right. You can make a visual or you can use that Kleenex and just say, you know what, you don't want to do this. We're going to figure something else out. I'm going to help you. And maybe he's learning to squeeze. Maybe he's, you know, sitting like this for pressure. I don't know what it is, but you can prompt him by using that tissue on his desk or by using a picture on his desk. I would, I would get him alone before class and I would go over that with him. Yep. Yep. I'd make a visual too. Yeah. So she doesn't care about the safety. Can you attach safety to the friendliness? Is there any way? Do what? Put mm -hmm. I don't know if you could somehow pair that friendliness, you know. It's unfriendly to bump into people. Exactly. So. It's unfriendly if you like totally knock somebody down when you're walking. Even if it's in an environment where you don't think somebody is going to be there, they could walk around the corner and you could run into them. That's an unfriendly thing to run into people. I don't know. Look up. <laughs> Head up. I know my my daughter used to wear with the Chuck. We used to call them Chuck Taylors, and they wrote all over them. I mean, you could ride on. Nobody would ever know, right? Those new Skechers, kind of the same way. I'm sorry to interrupt. I've got to run up to a little school. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, but I'm so I'm gonna have to leave. But I am gonna let Stacy finish you guys out for the last what? half hour, and you have to click her. You're looking at me, clicking at me. It's over there. <laughs> Thank you. I need my visual schedule. I can't keep track of anything. Well, it's nice to meet all of you. you. We might see you at Ify. Okay, we do, we, I do want to hit a couple of these things, particularly discrete trial instruction. We're moving into behavioral interventions, DTI, shaping, generalization, training, and task analysis. 
And when I, DTI is actually discrete trial training, but that sounds like I'm training my puppy. So we call it discrete, discrete trial instruction because you're actually instructing a child and they're learning a new behavior. So we're gonna um, take a look at a couple of these and she's leaving. So would one of you guys mind coming up here and doing a DTI with me? Okay. <laughs> Okay. Who has any runners? One, two, three, four. Okay. Who has children that aren't sitting for more than 30 seconds to a minute at a time? Oh, are, are those your runners? Okay. What are you currently doing about that? You don't, okay. <laughs> There's a dance with the run that you have to do? <coughs> so, do we have to teach the dance to everybody in her life? For I love it. I love it. Okay, she's going to sit for a few minutes here. But um, basically what I would do in that situation is I would do DTI, discrete trial instruction, and I would actually um, make sure that I taught the child to sit. We do that through something called compliance training. Has anyone heard of compliance training? Yep, I see some head shakes, okay? And it starts with baby sits. But basically you're teaching, I'm gonna use DTI to teach her to sit, okay? And it's going to be in a very systematic way that I'm going to do it. Okay? It's used when the learner needs small repeated steps presented in groups or trials. Because we know how important repetition is, correct? Because she's not going to pick it up real quick. I'm quite sure of it. So here are our steps. We're going to gain her attention. We're going to present an instruction. We're going to prompt the correct response because we want it to be what kind of learning? Errorless learning, right? Because we don't want to have something in there. And then we're going to provide reinforcement after she does it. Okay. So, so I've done, and I've had to use, I'm going to forget where that's at. So. I've had to use um, compliance training multiple times. A lot of our children, you know, would rather be climbing a bookcase or, you know, rolling across the floor as opposed to be sitting at a table. But we, all but we always say you kind of have to sit or kind of be in an attending position in order to learn, right? And so what we really start off with, and I would need another chair. I'm sorry to do this. Is it okay if I move a purse over? And I'm going to actually turn your chair sideways so you can... How we're probably going to start is face to face. I'm going to go ahead and have you come here. And sometimes you actually need an additional person behind. The additional person would be like I would help manipulate to sit down, okay? And that additional person might just be nicely rest their hands right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide a prompt. And if the child tries to get up, I actually may use a leg, okay? And I may just say, um, Sometimes we use something called get ready. Sometimes we say sit in chair. You guys may sign. You may hold a picture. And I'm going to work on literally five seconds at a time. Okay? Somebody behind her, I'm right here. And then if she's not moving, I'm just going to like slowly release. Okay? And then after my five seconds, then I'm going to provide reinforcement. So what do I have to know to do this? What's reinforcing? Okay? We want it to be pretty quick because we would like to do 10 of these trials in a row. Okay? So compliance training is literally this. We are getting her to sit. Okay? Not run. If she goes to run, what am I going to do? I'm going to go back in with some physical prompting, right? Because that physical prompting is what? Pretty easy to fade. Okay? But we've got to get that attention. Now, with autism, sometimes we say um, eye contact can be painful, can be hard, but I have to know that they are attending in some manner because I don't want them completely tuning out. 
So we have to figure out what that child's attending looks like. For some kids, it is eye contact. For some kids, he may be looking at a peripheral vision at me. Um, but if I know, if I have a, a material or something, I can tell that they're attending, then I've, got, I've reached my goal there. So compliance training, get ready training is necessary because you're not going to teach someone when you're running down the hallway after them. Or for, in my case, he ran out the door because we were so close to the outside, he was out my door and out the door into the playground faster than I could do anything. Okay? So um, that's really important with DTI. Okay? Taking kids from literally five seconds to 10 seconds up to 30 seconds jumps, and I've taken a child over the course of a summer to sit to tw for 20 minutes, okay? I don't sit for 20 minutes. So I thought that was a pretty big jump there. But we did slowly. The first person we faded was this person, okay? And as I said, I only applied prompts as needed and I always reinforced. Okay, even if I had leg and hands and everything going on, she would always receive some type of reinforcement from me from that DTI. So if you have a runner, it looks a little bit hands-on, but in the long run, it's going to be really effective. Okay, reinforcement, use of edibles, very good. Little edibles, not whole crackers. Okay, partial crackers, because if you want to get 10 trials in at a time, three times a day of doing this, that's what you're going to need to do. Little things, little M&Ms, baking ones or whatever. A goldfish. A goldfish, not a handful. Okay? We try not to use things that are toys because then we have to fight to get the manipulation away. Okay? In that situation. But that's DTI. Now I can do this using something to teach a child language. Okay? Once I've taught that get ready behavior, we can actually use a table. I can sit across from her. We're sitting right in the light. I'm I know, sorry. Go back. <laughs> I can sit across from her, uh, sitting at a table, and I can hold up a picture and sign it and have her model that picture to me or whatever I'm going to do. But the, what we're, it becomes discrete trial instruction is I'm discreetly and repetitively giving her the same trial over and over again. Based upon those principles that I need those trials, over and over again in close proximity in order to get it into my working memory. Okay? So it's a good tool. You can teach language. You can teach um, uh, step parts of the task analysis. I mean, it's a good, good tool. But you have to start with some compliance training if you have a child that's not what we would call table ready. Okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we are I would say one thing I did, I did reinforce opening and closing a door, and I let him do it 10 times, and then we would go back to our trials. Uh, and I know that sounds odd, but he loved to just watch a door open and close, open and close the outside door. Um, I've done head squeezes, I've done edibles, but things that I have a little bit more control over. And it is one-to-one, -one, okay? So that can somewhat be a deterrence, <laughs> But if you use some one to if you use that time up front, we always say you have less time in the end. So you're not going to be chasing that child. If you're chasing them when they're three, you're not going to be chasing them when they're 11. Okay? It's planned. It's systematic. You're going to collect on it. And again, data collection, if this is an important one, it could be a safety behavior for a child that runs out of an environment, okay? So um, in order to implement this, I have to know where I'm starting from. If I've seen the child sit for 10 seconds or 30 seconds, then where can I start at? I can start at that 30 second point, okay? Because I know I want to take them up to five minutes, six minutes, 10 minutes. Okay, so knowing that beginning and then knowing how fast I can progress that child through. How fast you can progress them through is typically based upon the type of reinforcement that you're using. How reinforcing is it? Because if it's really reinforcing, I'm going to sit down and perform that behavior over and over again for you and get that in. And then that skill acquisition, the final skill acquisition, 
Now maintenance and generalization, how would I teach what I just was working on here? How would I know? Okay, I'm going to take it to a different table. I'm going to have my paraprofessional work with them. I am going to, uh, or a different chair, different environment, um, and I may even switch up some of the reinforcers over time. But I'm going to do people and environment first for skill gener generalization. If I see that the child starts getting up and running again, I need to go straight back to where we were, okay? Not back to 30 seconds, but, but where we were when I left the child successful. And maybe it was five minutes, six minutes. Okay. All right, we're not going to go through these steps because we are so out of time. These are different things, deciding on what to teach, fine and gross motor skills, recreation, self-care, um, academic skills, language skills. But remember, discrete is a clear beginning and clear end. I know when I've started it, and I know when I've stopped it, and I'm done. And then clearly state the desired antecedent behavior criterion for mastery. So you don't want to progress a child through it too quickly, okay? Because then we may not be successful in the end. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and zip through these. Wow, we really broke this down for you guys, and you didn't need it this broken down, did you? Okay. All right, we are at 214, and we're at shaping, and we are, you guys are out of here at 230, is that correct? Honestly, I would rather do some Q&A right now rather than moving on, if you guys are comfortable with that, or if anybody wants to problem solve. Are there any, before we talk, move on, is there anything behaviorally, any of these children benefit from any DTI? Okay. Who's the guy? Go ahead. Um, you can actually use DTI to teach a child how to appropriately play with the toy. Okay? It's anything, it's any behavior that you can isolate and make discreet and have the child perform over and over again through a prompting system. Okay? So I could teach a child to play. Um, I can teach a child to go through some self care skills in the bathroom. Um, and I'm going to use that using a task analysis. And then what I would do, um, and you guys are all familiar with the task analysis, that's that big task that I'm going to break down into however many steps that child needs. But using DTI, I may pick the first three steps or the last three steps, okay, for that child to perform those with my prompting, and then I have that reinforcement. So I would actually use backward chaining on something like that. So maybe the last three things of a toileting sequence, okay? where the child um, wipes, stands up, pulls up pants, okay? No, I have older kids. Okay, so you're not toileting. I, I used it to help like, teach how to raise their hand. Like I have a girl with low language right. and she just get I up and... I do have some of those issues, mm -hmm. but now it's not okay for me to go into the washroom with them at this age, you know, so still with visual, I don't think I'm toileting with them, so even though I um, I'll be honest with you, I've been in the bathroom with children of all ages. Okay. Um, and I don't know what your rules are, but typically in schools, there has to be two adults in the restroom at, at a time. But yeah, I mean, if the skill isn't there, 
it, there's a comfort level and I think you have to let them know what your plan is and why you're doing it the way you're doing it and that there's always another adult for protection. It's for protection of you um, and the child both. But, you know, if you need to teach toileting to a 15-year-old, then you need to teach toileting to a 15-year-old because it, chances are somebody gave up on it at five and didn't do it systematically. And there is behavioral toileting, which we took out of here because we didn't know if any of you guys were working on toileting. But that is one of the evidence-based practices, and we took it out of the presentation. You do it through habit training, figure out when his times are. We're all kind of routinized. <laughs> yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. Absolutely. DTI would work. Your generalization would probably be in the gym with kids, but I would actually teach him to walk to his spot, sit down, follow those directions with no one in the gym with him. Okay? And I would reinforce him for doing that. And then. You know, maybe I'm going to go in there during a time when there's only 15 kids in the gym. Maybe it's an adaptive PE class or something, and we're going to practice those skills. And then I'm going to put him in that environment. Another thing that I might do, is he deaf or hard of hearing? Okay, well then what I would probably do is, if it, he might be getting overstimulated pretty quickly by the auditory input. So even the noise-canceling headphones might be beneficial because they can hear your instructions through them but it, it takes away all of that bouncing sound and that overstimulation that may be kind of revving him up a little bit. And there's also rules, okay? You have to do this, 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 and this, and then we listen to see if we can run. But maybe he's always able to run a couple of laps or run a, up and down a couple of times as a reinforcement. Okay? Yeah? If I'm doing DTI, I'm doing it quickly. I'm running them right back through the behavior. I would probably 10 times, three times a day. And again, it's to get it into that working memory. You're going to use this with a child that really needs that repetition. Now, there are some things that are really odd about this that we don't recommend all the time. And one is it's not in the functional environment, right? I'm doing this. We're sitting at a desk. We're doing this. But you always plan on, okay, if I'm teaching him this skill in this environment, then I'm going to see how he can sit in a cube chair at circle time. I'm going to see how he can sit in the library. I'm going to see how he can sit in music. Okay, and you work on those environments in the functional environment. But straight DTI, unfortunately, is oftentimes not done in the functional environment. And the re reason why some people don't like it is because people don't train for generalization. We always have to train for generalization. Anybody else? Nope. Everybody tired of hearing me talk? <laughs> okay. Well, we do have more information on there. I'm going to close down this screen and type our um, contact information in case anybody wants to bounce any ideas. Um, and Christy and I are both around quite a bit. Let me get down to a new slide. Does anybody see where my new slide went? This is such a weird view. How about I just come down here? Yes, I will in just a sec.
I don't know why mine is blue and hers isn't. I'm sorry? Oh, oh it is? I wonder why. Where am I at here? Oh, sorry. Okay, so that's how you can get a hold of both of us. Um, and we are around. I think we may be presenting at IFTE. Is that right? Uh, you've just been requested to present at the IFTE pre-conference. Okay, so at the IFTE pre-conference, and hopefully if we'll have time, we can get through quite a few of these things. And hopefully come back here next year. Okay. We have tools that we'd like to share with you guys, like the team transition tool that would follow the child from very little all the way up. We have reinforcer inventories, um, all kinds of fun tools that are very practical that stay with the child. So, it's, so information doesn't have to be recreated every time he or she transitions to a new environment. So, okay, yes. Um, we do have advanced courses at ISU. We were in the process of doing a certificate. However, the state doesn't allow, won't allow another certification at the LBS2 level. Um, so we've asked about it. We've been in the process of trying to create one at ISU, which would just be a certificate that said that you went through this five course sequence plus a practicum, an experiential practicum. But uh, we were being held up by IBHE at this point. So um, that's where we're at. We have two courses, though, currently up and running. One is a basic autism course. It's fully online. It's delivered fully online. Um, the other one is what we consider an advanced autism course that looks at advanced instructional strategies. And again, many of the things that we talk about in both of those courses are things that could be used for either population. Okay? Yeah. One is SED 452 and the other one is SED 49315. The one we're currently writing is assessment. So, and I know some people were talking about assessment earlier. All right. Are we good? I think we're good. Absolutely. Thank you.